Well, if you weren't here last week, I started off a new sermon series. This is going to be a a short sermon series out of the book of Joshua. And I'm not going to cover the whole of the book of Joshua. I'm just extracting a few points out of the early parts of the book of Joshua. I love the book of Joshua. If you've not read um, Joshua before, dig in. It is some good stuff in the book of Joshua. Get in there and read it and uh, see just how amazing God is in this story. The, the story of Joshua, the, the faithfulness of God to his people, fulfilling the promises that he had made generations before, just the work that he does is truly, uh, this is just like if there was an action movie of, of amazing things in the Old Testament, this would be part of that movie. Um, we started off, like I said, with it last week. Um, Joshua 1, Joshua is the transition point where we're moving from Moses into Joshua as the leader of the Israelite people. And you may remember, I said this a number of times last week, and it says it a whole bunch of times in Scripture, one of the big ideas that God wants to make sure we get out of this is, I'm God, don't be afraid, be strong, right? I am with you, you are my people, I am your God. Be strong and courageous. He says this over and over and over. Moses says it to Joshua, and God says it to Joshua. Be strong and courageous, for I go with you. So that's one of the big ideas. Uh, In in Joshua 2, we actually had a sermon on this two months, two and a half months ago. I preached about Rahab, if you remember, so I kind of put her in the Women of Faith series rather than preach it here. But uh, Rahab helped these guys out and let the spies out through the wall. And that's where we're going to kind of pick it up today is we're going to be in Joshua 3. So if you've got sermon notes in your bulletin that you want to fill out, feel free to grab and dig those out. I'm going to read to you a, a, a chunk of Joshua 3 here just to get us started and then uh, we will dig in with the rest of it. This is Joshua 3. My Bible says, Crossing the Jordan. It says, early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of your Lord, your God, and the priests, who are Levites, carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards between you and the Ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua then also said to the priests, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all of Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark and the Covenant, Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's water, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here and listen to the word of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you, and that he will certainly drive out from you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, the Jebusites, and maybe some termites. I don't know if your Bible says that. Verse 11. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you, Now then, choose twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe, and as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all of the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carried the ark of the covenant and went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage during all of harvest. Yet, as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan, Their feet touched the water's edge. The water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan. While the water was flowing down to the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite of Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing upon dry ground. This is the word of God. And that is an amazing story. I love the story. I love the story of Joshua. Joshua is so inspiring. And as I said, uh, we talked about this a while back. Joshua had sent out these two spies, right, to go and survey the land. 
And so these two spies had returned from Jericho, having followed Joshua's orders to check out the land, to check out the city. And through Rahab's help, uh, they had escaped um, being caught. They had been detected, but they never got caught. Rahab helps them out. And later on in the story, uh, Rahab's family will be spared because of her service. And long ways down the line, she shows up in Jesus' lineage. So it's a, a pretty neat story way back here in the Old Testament, right? And so they come back and they give their reports to General Joshua. And their, their hearts are just bursting with joy when they get back. And as they said these words to Joshua in Joshua 2, 24, they say, The Lord has handed over the entire land to us. Everyone who lives in the land is basically panicking because they have heard about us. And this was exactly the news that Joshua had been waiting for. When he hears this, immediately he sends out runners, as we heard just now. He sends out runners throughout the vast camp of Israel, announcing that first thing in the morning, we will be breaking camp. Okay, fold up your tents, pack everything up, and we're moving down to the banks of the Jordan River. They would finally, finally come to the entry point of the promised land. Remember, This comes on the heels of them wandering in the desert for 40 years. Can you imagine the the, the buzz that's circulating through the Israelite community that day? This day, right? We stand on the brink of a dream. We will come again, finally, to that very place where our parents and our grandparents, you see, they blew it. They had their shot and they blew it. They got to the Jordan and they failed. They were afraid and they blew it. So we spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness. This time, we're going to obey. We're not walking through that desert for 40 more years. I'm tired of manna. Right? And I'm sure there was a bunch of whining because they were Israelites. That's what the Bible says. They whined. They complained nonstop to Moses for 40 years. So I'm sure... They were ready, very ready. But as they approach this famous river, the River Jordan, they see that this river, see it forms this barrier between them and the place that they want to go. This this river is between them and, and this real estate that God had promised them. And when they get there and they see it with their own eyes by the light of day, Oh, they're a little confused and certainly a whole lot worried. Because you see, when they get to the banks of the Jordan River, we heard this in the scripture a moment ago, the Jordan is uncrossable. There's a simple sentence in verse 15 that I read. It says, now the Jordan overflows its banks throughout the harvest season. The normally gentle Jordan River, you've probably seen pictures or videos of people going down into the Jordan River and getting baptized, right? And and in this day and age, with the dams that there are and also with the incredible pressure uh, water usage on the Jordan River, it doesn't flood like it used to. But back in these days, it was a raging torrent, a giant torrent raging river swelled to flood stage. I don't know if you've ever lived through that. Even just a year ago when we got whatever it was, 11 inches of rain, that ripple river through my backyard came up about 40 feet in my backyard. That's a little frightening. That's just the ripple river. It barely meets the qualification of river normally. This is the Jordan. You see, in the Jordan River, when it hits flood stage back in these days, we're talking like a 40 mile per hour current. It swells to over a mile wide in places. And what's worse is the area that's all along this river, because you've got to remember they're kind of in a desert climate. When you get near water, that's where everything grows. So when the floodwaters come up, it hides all this stuff that's trying to trip you and trap you and drown you that you can't see that's under the water now. So they show up to the edge of this river thinking, we're supposed to go where? 
again? Huh? What? Really? They're frightened. They're concerned. They're worried. This is the sight that greets them. Hundreds of thousands of people, probably millions even of people. Yet, they come and they pitch their tents right on the little bluff overlooking the Jordan River. Now, the Bible tells us that they spend the next three days and nights there. And each and every day, each and every hour, as that river goes rushing by, I can imagine that river is just eroding their confidence. The waiting. You ever had to wait at the foot of something that was frightening? The tension that it builds in you? That waiting is just pounding on them every day. The weight getting heavier. Pounding reality into the Israelites. We got to cross that. Maybe some doubts, you know, they start to enter in their minds. Sitting around the campfire at night, you can hear logs crashing as they go downriver. You can hear the torrent while you're sitting around cooking dinner around the campfire. You might be talking with your neighbor from the tent next door, you know. My wife's a good swimmer. She might make it, but boy, I'm not so good, and I don't think our kids are going to make it. How are we going to get across this thing? Some of these folks got infants, right? They had a baby last week. What are they going to do? How can we brave this flood? And in an instant, no's began to form in their minds and in their hearts as they listened to the roar of the river. It's easy for us to, to relate to those emotions, isn't it? It's easy for us to relate to the thoughts of Israel. Because many of us, I think, have faced our own personal Jordans. Our own personal Jordans that feel so, so permanent, feel so powerful that we don't even want to try to make it across. Our lives feel stalled, like we're stuck on the wrong side of God's promises. We, we read our Bibles and we read and we hear about this abundant life, but yet we can't make it out of the wilderness. Not only do we feel that way, sometimes churches feel that way too. Stalemated by the, the promise of, of something great with God, but blocked by all different kinds of barriers. But God can turn a no way into a highway. Hear that. Our God can turn a no way into a highway. Can't he? The great question that loomed over the camp of Israel looms over our lives as well today. Will we walk by sight or by faith? That's the question. Do we really believe that God can handle the impossible? Do we believe it? Joshua 3 goes on to tell us something that is echoed throughout Scripture. What is impossible with men is possible with God. Find it in Luke 18, 27, if you want to see a New Testament reference. And you see in the story here, God was about to reveal the steps that must be taken in every life, in every church, if we want to move forward in faith, freeing ourselves from the shackles of our past, moving into our God-given future. The experiences, uh, the decisions that that are reported in this chapter, as I just read it, are a a major breakthrough for the nation of Israel. A whole new generation learned that victory depended upon God, not on them. And I think as we as a church stand on the the brink of a God-sized future and consider, yeah, there's obstacles that could hold us back. Maybe sometimes things in our lives personally feel like it's impossible. How do we get from here to there? But remember, these things are no match for the God of the uncrossable. He knows how to get you through the impossible. 
this is God's way here. God's way for us to cross our uncrossable obstacles. First, we must follow the movements of God. We see this in Joshua 3, 2 through 4. It says, After three days the officers went throughout the camp and commanded the people, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God carried by the Levitical priests, you must break camp and follow it. What did this command mean to the Israelites? Why would, why would God care so much about a piece of furniture that he would require it to go first, right? What was the big deal? If you don't know about the ark, let me tell you. The ark was a visual reminder of God's power, of his faithfulness, of his provision, of his love, of his plan for the lives of the Israelites. And greater than that, the ark was an Old Testament equivalent of Jesus as Emmanuel, God with us. When this chest led the way, it meant that God was going out in front of them. He would, so to speak, take the first steps into the Canaan River. Their task was to follow his lead, to pursue his presence, to come after him. He was going first. He was leading the way. Verse 4 then lays out the procedure which they were to do to make this happen. It says, but as these priests go out into the river, make sure you keep a distance of about a thousand yards between yourself and the ark. Don't go near it, it says, so that you can see the way to go. For you haven't traveled this way before. God was very, very particular about the distance that he wanted them to be away from the ark. And his reasons are, are clear. He wanted it to be possible so that all of the people of Israel would be able to see which way God wanted them to go. If, if the people who were up front, if they crowded up right up close to where the ark was, nobody else would be able to see the direction. Nobody else would be able to see. All they could do is follow the pack instead of follow God. You don't want to follow the pack. Follow God, right? And so God is telling them, no, keep a distance from it so that you can see, so that you can follow me rather than follow the pack. So now picture this scene. All of Israel is camped out on this sloping hill beside the River Jordan. The ark is positioned a, a thousand yards away from them. Everyone in the nation would be able to see it. The priests would bear it by rods upon their shoulders. They would walk out. They'd stride out towards this raging torrent of a river. And everyone would understand the point that God intended for Israel to breach the River Jordan with him. But it could only be done if they focused on following him. Centuries later, the true ark of God would come among us. Emmanuel, Jesus Christ. The ark contained the Ten Commandments, you see. Jesus fulfilled the law. The ark provided the manna by which God fed his people. Christ is the bread of life. The ark held a symbol of God's power to bring life out of death. Jesus is alive from the dead and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And so Hebrews 12.2 calls us to keep our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. We are all just constantly enduring. But while we endure, we are truly entering the future moment by moment. <clears throat> and as we, we gaze at the challenges that we see on the road before us, we see the things that are coming our way, don't we? We, we? we see cancer. We see the creditors. We see this crisis coming our way. Most of the things that come at us don't come so much as a surprise. Occasionally they do. And when we're looking at that on our road in the future, it's easy to conclude that we're stuck in the wilderness, right? Right? We're away, we're lost, we're nowhere near the abundance of God. Don't buy into that lie. God has something 
great in store for you and for us. This is true for the body of Christ as it is for you personally. We can't always see our way clearly. We don't always know what's lurking under the rushing waters of our river Jordans. All of us probably have looked at our future and wondered, oh, what's to come? We've seen challenges at times, things that didn't go as we planned, and we've concluded there's no possible way I can do this. Right? So what do you do when you're facing the impossible? Well, you do what Peter did, right? When he walked on water. You fix your eyes on Jesus. When you see the impossible coming, you fix your eyes on Jesus. And you see, we know from the story of Peter, the minute his eyes went off of Jesus, he looked down at the raging waters. What happened? Right? Right? Down into the water he went. He was looking at Jesus and all of a sudden he remembered, people can't walk on water. Oh no! Right? Yet Jesus reached down to save him anyhow. We must all focus and follow the movements of our Lord so that we will go where he is leading Where he is leading, we need to follow. Where you go, Lord, I will follow. That should be on our hearts, in our minds, and on our tongues. (coughs) Excuse me. The second thing we see out of this passage that we must do is we need to consecrate ourselves. Excuse me for a minute here. Sorry, I knew that tickle wasn't going to go away until I really coughed. The second thing we need to do, though, is we need to consecrate ourselves. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves because the Lord will do wonders among you tomorrow. The Hebrew word for consecrate means to prepare, to dedicate, to be hallowed, to be holy, to be separate or set apart. God was telling his people that if they were going to cross the uncrossable, if they were going to follow the will of God, that they must be set apart, that they must be holy. That involved two simple things for them to do. The very first one is it involved personal repentance of all their known sin. They had to get right with God. One of the primary reasons Israel found that their way was blocked was simply because of their sin. (coughs) I am having a problem here. Sorry. The reason Israel struggled, the reason Israel had not taken the promised land previously was their sin. Isaiah the prophet wrote, Indeed, the Lord's hand is not too short to save and his ear is not too deaf to hear. But your sins have built a barrier between you and your God, and they have made him hide his face from you so that he does not listen. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. On the eve of one of the greatest days, if not the greatest day in the history of Israel, they were commanded, be certain that you make yourself right with God. (coughs) Examine your life. Confess, forsake sin, and devote yourself wholly to the Lord. The second way that they were supposed to consecrate themselves was by being alert to see where God was at work. They were to pause the mundane, put aside the normal functions of life so that they could be on spiritual high alert. God was about to do something amazing, right? God's about to do some amazing things among them. We don't want you to miss it. Don't miss out on this amazing thing God has in store because you were so busy over here doing something that didn't matter. Something you could have done at some other time. So they turned their focus to God. 
church. Consecration means that I will set aside the typical and put my spiritual on so that I will, I will be ready to see where God is working around me so that I can join in with what He is doing. To cross the uncrossable, we must first fix our eyes upon Jesus, sensing His movements, and then follow. And then focus ourselves on being on constant alert spiritually for the hand of the Lord and see where He is working and moving around us and through us and among us. And once we've done these things, Scripture says there's still one other thing that we need to do. It says we need to step out and stand still. We see that in verses 7 through 13. Look at 7 and 8 if you're following along in your Bible. You see it on the screen as well. It says, The Lord spoke to Joshua. I will tell you, today I will tell, or it says, The Lord spoke to Joshua. Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all of Israel, so they will know that I will be with you just as I was with Moses. Command the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant when you reach the edge of the waters. Stand in the Jordan. Now jump ahead to verse 13. It says, When the feet of the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all of the earth, come to rest in the Jordan waters, its waters will be cut off. The water flowing downstream will stand up in a mass. (coughs) Decision time has come. Are we going to move? The priests are carrying the Ark of the Covenant and they've got to step out in the water. They're going to walk out into that flood and then stand still in the middle of it. Right there where we can see it. (coughs) The command of God was as they step out into that water and they get their feet wet, when they stop there, he'll stop the water and then you will follow. You see... Faith moves us forward in God's way, in God's timing. And there will come a time, there will come a moment where you must act on what God has said. And if you don't, you'll never cross the Jordan rivers in your life. Get this. Focusing on the Lord is essential. And consecrating ourselves to the Lord is vital. But we will never cross the river unless we take steps of faith. Our eyes and our hearts can be right on, but if we don't move our feet, we will never progress in God's work. We must commit ourselves, our time, our energy, our money, our lives, to what God is doing, or it won't happen. You can't plan a vacation forever, right? At some point, you actually just have to go. Otherwise, it's not a vacation. It's just a dream. We have to take that step of faith. Now imagine this. Standing near the banks of the thundering Jordan River. You've got armed warriors, men's... Men with swords and shields. But standing right next to them are wide-eyed mothers with helpless babes in their arms. Some probably born the night before. All around them are the flocks, all of their possessions in the world. It's all gathered there. All ready to move when God opens a way. All the people had their eyes on the ark that day. It was positioned high on the shoulders of the priests. The priests, they're wading out slowly into that water, right? Everyone was ready. Clean hearts, spiritually alert, watching for something that only God could do. At that point already, the step of faith had been taken. Now the the priests stop and they're standing still and A great hush would have probably fallen over the crowds. Why did they stop? Then somebody noticed something. The water began to recede. Somewhere upriver, somewhere beyond their sight, the water stopped, right? And not only that, 
But miraculously, this riverbed is dry. You can imagine the muck and dirt and soil and sediment and all the stuff that had been in the bottom of that river. It's dry. The, the thunder of the river is transformed into the thunder of faithful footsteps walking across it. This amazing event was so amazing in the minds of Israel that they wrote a song about it. You find it in Psalm 14. Psalm 114, sorry. It says, The sea looked and it fled. The Jordan turned back. The mountains skipped like rams. The hills like lambs. Why was it sea that you fled? Jordan, that you turned your back. Mountains that you skipped like rams. Hills like lambs. And then comes the answer. Tremble, earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob. I truly long to see what God will do in our lives and in our church if we will learn these lessons from Joshua. We all have our own personal Jordan rivers to cross. Challenges that stretch out before us. Things that are simply too great for us to be able to go it alone. But we must believe that nothing is too difficult for God. And then rely upon Him. We need to focus ourselves on Christ, on following Him as He leads the way through. We must set ourselves apart and be holy, getting ourselves ready to move when God moves. While we might not know where God is leading, we must rest assured that if he is leading, then we need to follow. Are you ready to cross the Jordan? Let's pray.